I know how to do that. Test, 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 test. Good afternoon. It is almost afternoon. My name is Sandy Cleveland, and I'm the editor of the journal, ACB Journal, and we're very happy to have you this afternoon. Uh, a couple of things, then, you know, we've all heard this a couple of times. Uh, please silence your cell phones, or someone will come and hit you up the head, you know, and you get all embarrassed. Um, locate the exits here. If you need to get out of here, you know, the restrooms are down that way. And um, please, no flash photography. We are live streaming. So, oh no, if I mess up, it's there. <laughs> okay. It is my pleasure to introduce Chris Green, who is from the Sounds of Freedom Man and Color Guard, and Daniel Bassett from the Pride Wind Ensemble, and David Triplett Rosa from the Tampa Bay Pride Band. And they're, <laughs> hey, I did do it. Um, we are presenting today Promoting Diversity Through Programming. Welcome. And we have a sponsor for today's session, so I want to welcome our representative from Peak Music Travel. We are thrilled to be uh, the sponsor for this program. We are new to the CPA and, and, and really enjoying our time here. We wanted to uh, mention to you a new program we have for the last 45 years. We've been taking, we've taken 40,000 kids to Europe over the summer on group ensembles. And so in 2024, we'll be doing a community band, orchestra and choir tour. So come to our booth and find out more information about that tour. And uh, thank you again and enjoy this workshop. Okay, so this session is in two different parts. The first part is the three artistic directors from the Pride Bands in, in Florida. We're all members of Pride Bands Alliance. Uh, the motto of Pride Bands Alliance is music, visibility, and pride. And we all kind of look at things in a different kind of way as far as diversity goes. So we're just gonna kind of talk a little bit about how we approach our concerts. I'll start first, obviously, since I have the microphone, it makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, we do a theme concert every year. The season has a theme, and each individual concert has a theme within that. My goal is to take the audience through a journey, whether that is an educational journey, emotional journey, whatever. I definitely follow the Dr. Tim school of thought that every concert should have a team. what might be programmable in the next season. Uh, I'm programming two and three seasons ahead because I know a new piece of music is coming out. For example, there's someone who posted on Facebook, and I think that's where we first connected. Uh, he's a German composer. He put out a SoundCloud version of his piece. I like this piece. 
I wrote them and said, hey, I see it's not in publication yet. When are you planning to publish it? So, well, in the next few months, I've got some European debuts. I'm like, well, we're interested. That turned into a communication and a friendship with that composer. We are now going to do, be the world premiere of that piece in June. It's like, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm going to live stream it. I'm going to promote this living composer who's trying to get into the American audience because he's in a different country, different world, to try to promote that. So making those small steps makes a huge difference in just connecting the world of people. And while I would like my ancestors and people, descendants, to profit off the work I'm doing now, I would also like to be celebrated while I'm alive. And I think we all deserve that as artists. And so the more that we can do that and let people know that we appreciate what they're doing now, programming their work, making it visible can make a huge difference. So uh, I'll pass it over to Dan. Sure, um, thank you. I feel like we're on a fireside chat on these big comfy chairs, <laughs> but uh, it's nice. Um, so I'm Dan from the uh, Pride Wind Ensemble. We're in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, we take a similar approach to Chris in programming the music. So I do pick a theme. And uh, the, those vary widely from concert to concert. Last week, we just did a night at the Pops. And of course, our program here was uh, some overlap, but quite different as well, um, because I really wanted to celebrate the diversity that, um, of composers that are, are readily available to us right now. Um, so uh, within the theme, I, I look at programming as everything from who's on the podium to uh, what guest performers, because we do a lot with guest performers, whether it be singers or we have dancers, we've had acrobats, we've had, you name it, um, on the stage, magicians. Uh, because I, I, personally though, I feel like we need to meet our audience where they are, and not everyone in our audience is a band geek, or hopefully not. Otherwise our audiences are gonna be really, really small and um, just very specific. So to reach a wider audience, which is part of our mission, is to, uh, as, as Chris said, be visible. Uh, you know, we try to meet the, the audience where they are. So looking at the performers is definitely, you know, a diverse group of performers, uh, guest artists, as well as, um, as I said before, who's on the podium. Um, I can say this because I am an old white man, uh, that the band world has been dominated for a long time by old white men. And I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. Um, so there's nothing <laughs> wrong with my, my assistant director is a, a fantastic Sarah uh, woman and she's incredible and and there's and when we have guest performers come in uh, I try to make sure that we have different diverse generally um, underrepresented populace uh, we have a youth band component where we get a living composer conductor to come in uh, and and uh, and work with students in the tri county area and uh, we go after a diverse population there next year's uh, Chandler Wilson, who we, we uh, played one of his pieces last night, The Fanfare to the Stars. Um, so this looking at that, but as, as Chris also mentioned, looking at and seeking out composers um, who are living right now. The, the world of searching for music doesn't end at J.W. Pepper. You know, more and more composers are self-publishing, and they're out there, and you can find them all over the place. Um, I regularly, and I know this is a little crazy, conductors, put out to my band members, here's our theme, send me suggestions. And one of our uh, bass clarinet players came with the suggestion of this wilderness. I'm like, I've never heard of this. Um, and, and Kate and Lushimura, and I was like, who is this lady? I've learned uh, incredible about her, and a Japanese Canadian who's really into programmatic music that revolves around nature. How cool is that? So we a program wilderness. It was a really funky, fun piece to play. Um, so, so you, you can look outside of the, the box of J.W. Pepper, and, and uh, Randall Standridge is doing a lot with helping um, young upcoming composers get their their, um, their music published as well. So it's intentional, and you know we've all played Holst a lot, right? But there are other composers out there. Um, so we seek out African American composers. We we seek out. Asian composers, we seek out women composers. There's great women composers out there. You need to seek them out and make it an intentional. And why? The question is why? Why? I just want to play great music. Well, you know, I used to think that too, but but it's in this day and age, especially here in Florida, where things are changing um, from our, our politicians, we really need to uh, 
embrace and celebrate the, the diversity that is out there in our music, in our conductors, uh, and in our guest artists. Hi, I'm David Triple Rosa, artistic director of uh, Tampa Bay Pride Band, Symphonic Winds. Um, our program, uh, we have it's a Kata Lullaby, um, Respighi's uh, Pines of Rome, um, Pancantita, which is uh, the composer's parents' names combined, um, and uh, Journey Through Orion. Um, each piece has its theme in the program. And I, I approach um, music selection like you would when it comes to, equate a, the analogy would be closer to when you're dining. Um, I mean, are you gonna eat at the same restaurant every day, every week? I mean, you wanna diversify your meals. Um, you want the, the, healthy, the healthy meal this day, you want something hearty uh, the next day. Um, you want something that you are going to regret later and be like, I'm okay with that. Um, and that comes, and that happens with our program. I mean, sometimes we challenge our, um, not only our members, but the artists with the programs we select. Sometimes it's out of just a little bit this far out of our reach sometimes, but we do it um, because the quality is there. I know some people when um, can be challenged with the idea of having to research their composers and put more thought into, am I gonna go with the standards? Um, diversifying your thoughts and I mean all, and again, I'll use the, the food analogy. Think about the aromas, the spices, how good some of it is just like, the thoughts and the, the feelings you get when you try something different. And it has to be intentional. It has to be with purpose. Um, and several composers, when we do the research between myself and um, our other conductors, we spend some time researching um, in other countries. And it's hard to do. And it's we're really fortunate that we have a lot of people in our area and we kind of in the same way when it comes to, hey, this is what we're looking at. What are your ideas? Because we don't know everything. We don't know everybody. The, um, the world of music is vast and it's awesome. Like Oscar Navarro, I mean, his, his music is fantastic. And when we're researching, we're diversifying the letter, but we also want to be authentic, you know, as much as possible, having a composer that's from the area you know, putting in some time to really have quality, authentic music. And sometimes, you know, we, we've been there. We've all played a piece by a composer that's nowhere near that area. Nowhere near that culture. Not from that culture whatsoever. So it's an interpretation on what they're hearing, which they do a great job of. But we could take it a step further with just a quick search. I mean, nowadays, how easy and how wonderful technology allows us to diversify our program simply by putting in a search and giving that added passion, spice, aroma to our music that would not have been there had we not challenged ourselves to kind of go abroad at times to reach out. When you're going to another country, are you ordering McDonald's? Maybe, maybe you'll stop by real quick just to check out if the soda tastes the same, you know, right? But you're gonna be there and you're gonna try those things out. Why not? And it's the same approach I think all of us would agree um, that we are pressing upon through these events that take the time to do it, take the time to research, take the time to invest in these composers that are out there that are wonderful. And then we find out that no, not good. Not good, not good for many reasons. Not only the quality of the music, but also, hey, this person feels this type of way and we don't support it. And that's also a thing that happens. And we have to be cognizant of our membership and our audience and our mission. So that type of research happens there too. And over the years, we've kind of seen some things getting spotlighted here and there about particular composers, but, all in all, 
it has been amazing. And I think all of you that are here, you are a testament to how awesome the world is in band and orchestra and these living composers that are doing some authentic, high quality music. And it, it just drives us even further to do more and reach out more. So it's fun. It's a fun thing to do. It's re research and find new. So two things I want to kind of leave you with, because we're going to switch panels here in just a few minutes. We'll give you a chance to have questions to give another side of the, of the opinion. Uh, one we all kind of mentioned about asking our membership. We have a music advisory committee. Here's the thing. You can you have two months. Send me any links. And I always say, if you don't send me a link of how to purchase it, I'm not interested. So either the composer's website, J.W. Pepper, Barnhouse. You mentioned Randall Standridge. We had some of his uh, new composers in the site reading session yesterday. There's ways to find it. But if you task your membership with finding those things, they will find some of the coolest stuff you've never heard. For example, if someone said, have you programmed Chandler Wilson? No, here's Fan Further the Stars. Next thing you know, I get the program from Daniel Bassett. It's on their program last night, and we're playing it in, in June. Uh, the Pride Bands Alliance has a lot of ADs that work together to share information as well. So we find a new composer. Like, we love this composer. You should program it. Here's, here's a, a clip of us of playing it. The other thing, and I hope we'll all remove this from our vocabulary, never say it checks a box. That is the most degrading thing we can say. So if you want to actually find African-American composers, you can find them. There are lists. There's people that say, hey, we know you're looking for this, but not because, just because of the race, but because we want to highlight people in this category that may not get in, getting played as much. Let's make the resource available. There's a lot of open source materials out there. Uh, there's a lot of them on our ACB 2023 webpage. They're being carried over to the ACB page. ACB does a great job of composer spotlights, if you've seen them. They do this neat little image which shows the most played piece of this composer and other titles popping out. You, I'm always finding new stuff. Uh, there's a, I think a month ago I found a composer I'd never heard of. I'm like, wait a minute. And we talk about Steve Reinke. Into the Raging River I've done a few times. And I heard Casey the Bat at a rehearsal I was down just having to be visiting. I'm like, I didn't even know he did that arrangement. Well, that's cool. And then to find out later that he is openly gay, I didn't know. I, comp I programmed him because I enjoyed his music. I enjoyed his style of writing. It was very playable for my ensemble, and they enjoyed it. But I know that extra little bit about the composer, it gives me a little more incentive to say, hey, for me, having an LGBTQ+, as we all do, ensemble with a lot of allies, they want to know that. If you go to a certain band and find out what's driving them to be in your ensemble, you may find there's hotbeds. You mentioned local composers. That's incredible. You may not know there's a brilliant composer two towns over, but if you engage them with doing a commission piece or a guest conducting spot or simply programming the work, and would you like to come to the concert? Would you be willing to speak? Would you be willing to do a video introduction of the song that we can play so people have a little more background? So don't just play music to play music. Uh, regurgitation of performance is just that. These are not tests. We're here to make music, make art, make people feel something. So yes, we all want to be good. We all say kind of funny. It, it's fun not to suck. It's much more fun if the music's great. But let's be honest. We don't have the perfect ensembles. We're a community band. We're mixed up with people with masters in performance, sitting beside somebody who just picked up an instrument in their 40s because they wanted something to do socially. So meet your audiences where you are. Meet your memberships where you are. Use your resources and go beyond just, this sounds cool. I played this in college. This is nostalgic for me because this was my high school marching band show. So. Good. Uh, just to piggyback on what you said, it's, it's, we've, you can do more than just make music at a concert. You can make a difference to your membership and your audience. You can reach them in so many levels. As Chris said, definitely want to make them laugh, cry, and, and have some sort of emotional response. And you can do that through programming you know, a diverse population of composers and guest artists. Are we doing a Q&A? Yeah, we've got, we've got about five minutes before the next panel comes in to talk about the same thing. Uh, if there's any questions from the audience. Any questions at all? Yes. So coming back to what you said about ensuring that, oh, I forgot. 
Yeah. You just gave me a very dangerous weapon. <laughs> so coming back to what you were speaking about regarding, um, you know, programming composers that are harmful. This was something that was brought up, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago in the music selection committee meeting, particularly with a very openly transphobic composer. And I was like, we cannot program this. And we had someone bring up, well, are we gonna participate in cancel culture? What would your response be? <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't even entertain the idea of like, it, it, you know, the idea of like even broaching the idea of cancel culture. I think of um, they're going to exist and do what they do and people are good. That's not my business. My business is to make sure we have quality music that we're, we're, we're looking at pushing our mission to our audience and to our community according to what we have in the most positive way. The way I function is as positively as possible. I would, and me personally, I would, my board, I would say we're not entertaining that topic. We're doing what we need to do that's based off of our, our mission and we're sticking by it. Um, and we're gonna approach things in the most positive way. I'm not, I, it, I'm not in the business of canceling anyone out. I'm functioning on highlighting the best of the best of the best in our community, outside of our community. And if they don't fall into the best, then that's where they fall and that's okay. Um, they, but, and again, I just, I don't, I don't, and I wouldn't want anybody in, on our board or in our mem membership to give any light, more light to that. And that happens sometimes by just focusing, redirecting your focus onto your mission. I will say just one quick thing on that. If you are programming from the, this concept of what you want the audience to go through, you can often find pieces that are very similar for the audience to experience your membership experience from a different composer. I know a lot of times I'll go and we have our, our pieces, and I'm like, okay, there's 18 songs I want to do. Okay, this achieves the same thing as this achieves. Which one serves our purpose better? That's a good way to do that. Yeah, I would, um, I would say that uh, as, there's millions of compositions and I deeply care about the membership of my ensemble. And if someone, if there's a composer or a piece that's making someone feel negative towards that experience, they're there because they're, they're, it's a community band. They're, they're there for social, they're for, they're for the music, they're for, they're for many reasons. But if anything making them feel like they don't want to participate because of this composer, I don't want to program that. It's about it's about their feelings. It's not about canceling anyone anyone out. Um, so this is how I would approach it. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, Courtney. We have attempted to be very diverse in our programming, but our audience is not. Uh, our audience seems to be in the retired realm of life and they've come to expect a concert band to play um, those old worn out tunes and they can you know, sing the lyrics or clap their hands or tap their feet and they understand the program notes to those pieces. When we've introduced new um, composers and put the stories to them, they enjoy them, but they don't seem to connect with them. So how do you work around that? And our members love playing any music, so they don't, you know, yes, they enjoy the new pieces um, because they're tired of playing the same old, same old. And our membership is from 16 years old to 89 years old, so they've been through all the genres. So how do you address your membership? So for, as far as the audience, I always say meet the audience where they are. So your audience is a specific, you know, maybe retired, and directors, people who just want to hear their old war horses, move the needle slowly. The other approach I would take is um, we always have, um, we put on concerts, but I call it a show, act one, act two. It's like it's a show because there's always something more than just the music. I know my audience wants to see something visual or hear a singer or a dancer or this or that. Um, and often I would do videos for Fanfare to the Stars that created this whole uh, uh, 
uh, traveling through the galaxy, uh, you know, with all kinds of, of wonderful uh, images and videos to go along with it because they can't always attach to, okay, this is a new composer and I don't know the tune, but you can still reach them through other other means. So uh, if you have the capability, you know, to, to project a video uh, presentation, a lot of us do that. Um, it's becoming more popular among bands. Um, I, I definitely recommend doing that and, and just moving the needle slowly. Um, um, you mentioned our audience. I know this panel isn't about our audience so much as what we're programming, um, but we are very heavily grant funded. Um, and our grantees want to see a, a diverse audience. And I think we all, those of us who are cognizant of it, struggle with that. How do we reach um, a more diverse audience? And uh, it's something that we struggle with too. So it's, it's going to, uh, we're, we've got a whole committee for it, but it's going to be, I should put Adam on the spot, right, grant president. But we're, we're, it's, it's about um, advertising and pulling in. Um, from other areas, and, and it's, it's a difficult thing to try to diversify your audience a little bit as well. And we'll wrap up here with our final two comments and we'll switch over to other presenters. Thank you so much so far for all the great comments. I would say you can also diversify your performance venues. If you have a place, we do free concerts in the park and they expect this, 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 that's great. And maybe concentrate your moving the needle into something specific. Maybe we move this into a certain performance hall and advertise strictly for that one thing. Then you might find you're pulling people into your audience that haven't seen the other stuff because they don't want to. So it's not always educating your audience, although it is, it's moving a little bit, but it's choosing, we want to do this, so this is the venue for that. And I think a lot of bands do a Pops concert, or just going to play things that either the band really enjoys, your audience really enjoys, free in the park. Who doesn't love a, love a free concert? But if I want to play something very contemporary, maybe I want to find an intimate space with maybe 100 seats and advertise to the collegiate area and the schools and try to get a different audience in but doing a concentrated effort on that one idea may pull people in and then you can engage them for the, the group as a whole i think you, this is a really great question um and i think the an area to go to to ask the question to get a better answer that's probably more informed in the sense of surveys and research and such as through orchestras. Um, orchestras have had this problem and continue to have this problem with the, the literature that they program. Band has a wide spectrum of music. Um, orchestras, big orchestras, you will see in here that they, are, they hold to these type of programs because of their audience and moving the needle. So, um, I think a great uh, direction, because I don't have the answer, um, but I will have you think about going into the direction of people who are already in the area of solving that or moving the needle. Um, and that's through orchestras, community and professional alike. I would highly suggest reaching out to them to see where they are with things because they're doing it. They're building their audience um, and it may be over time and then thinking about developing your youth to come in to hear and to have a night of them because eventually these things move on in time and life. We're not always here forever. So it's one of those things that you can build in some things to start reaching out to maybe a younger audience to provide that for them is what my only thought is to, to think about. My position with my hands on this matter is Band members who are bored with the content, you're not going to have to invite them much longer. Yeah, your, your audience, your band makes your audience as well. And your and the that brings to light that maybe educate your band members to educate your audience about this is what it's what we're doing and take a brain break from all the other stuff and reach out to this uh, and go for it. That's a fantastic point. To Neil's point, if you schedule two new pieces of concert, and the, at least two, the band has never played, they have something a little more challenging, the good players will come back and the audience will sit through those pieces and they go, oh, that was interesting, but you know, maybe not a great melody that I can walk out of you singing, but, you know, I learned something. Turn your music and introduce our next band. Oh, yeah, I have to get this stuff. Okay. <laughs>
So we're clocked. <laughs> At this time, we would like to present you three with the certificates for being fine clinicians at the Orlando 2023 ACB convention. <laughs> Only one. Only one. Yeah, I'll, let's do it three times. <laughs> 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 the Association of Concert Bands Certificate of Appreciation as a clinician at the ACB 2023 convention, convention <laughs> is awarded to David Triplett Rosa, Chris Green, and Daniel Bassett. In appreciation of your time and talents as panelists for the Association of Concert Bands 2023 convention in Orlando, Florida, and the appreciation of your dedication to community bands. Okay, so our, thank you. So our next two panelists are both from the uh, collegiate world. They both doctorate, right? Yeah. Yes. So introduce a doctor. Yes. <laughs> My brain is it's mush. Dr. Kevin Bove. It's the jet lag. It is. And Dr. Wesley Broadlands. Can I start by answering your question as well? We'll stay on the same topic. So when I approach programming and thinking about the audience, I think of um, the audience comes for three reasons. One, they just love band music. So they were in band, they're supporting band, they just love band, can't get enough band. Two, they're there for a person. So they're a family member or friend, coworker, relation some way to somebody on stage, or maybe there's a guest artist they're really excited to see. Or three, there's a non-musical value to it. So whether it's the theme or some other element, the feeling of community, the feeling of belonging. So I try to, you know, I can't really control whether or not they love band. Um, I can motivate my musicians to invite and like get the word out and be excited and advocating. But three, I spend the most time focusing on that theme and those extra elements. So I have, we the first concert this year I did was a Top Gun themed concert because the Top Gun film had just come out over the summer. I only to play one Top Gun medley because there actually only is one out there. Um, but everything else was related to light or planes in some way. And a few of the pieces I, I stretched, which was actually kind of fun for the audience for me to explain like how this is like six degrees of separation from the concert theme. But also during our intermission, the, uh, we got the audience to make paper airplanes. We had a target they could throw their paper airplanes at and we gave them Top Gun stickers. We had a pilot come from the local um, uh, air field and give a pre-concert lecture with the Q&A with the audience. We gave, we raffled off a free flight lesson from that same airfield that they donated to us. So getting those extra elements in, it makes it really fun and exciting for the audience. Um, our last concert, everybody was like, hey, this was like a party. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're not like professional groups. So, you know, to get people in the audience, I, I believe it feels like there has to be those extra elements. Um, and that's how I advocate for that. Did you have something in there? I did. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I want to say about uh, piggybacking on what everyone has talked about with programming is coming from the collegiate world is, and this has been a trend where uh, our students are not really getting the whole package of what it's like to program and certainly uh, programming for a variety of audiences. Uh, what I try to do at the university, uh, because I'm serving two populations, uh, my undergraduates and my graduate co cohort, is um, even though we come from a world of academia, the one thing that we need to do, and then I do this on every concert, there's something, as what Dr. Bobe said, for everyone. Uh, we're going to have uh, some of the core rep. We're also going to have some fun pieces movie music or things of that nature even though we're in this space is that bleeding through yeah. <laughs> okay so i just talk louder yeah okay so then um one thing that i like to do in my programming is um as some people aren't fans of theme concerts but i'm a theme person I like to do that now. I know that that can pigeonhole you a little bit into what you do. But the one reason that I do theme concerts is because of the, of the times we're in right now. Uh, the thing that it has allowed me to do is to be more creative. For example, I'm now doing more pieces with different uh, forces. Like I've programmed some pieces with dancers. Uh, 
there is a wonderful work uh, by uh, composer Nancy Galbraith that we did. Um, as she has a work called Danzas de los Duendes. And uh, as far as I knew, that had not ever been done with dancers. It's a standalone wind band piece. And I called her and I said, do you mind if we choreograph this? And she said, first of all, why? And I said, I just think it should be choreographed. And she said, no one has ever asked me. And then said, OK. So we did it. And she loved it. And I think it's still on her website. So uh, she, she loved that. Uh, we're also, I like to do now in this space that we're in, there's a lot of music that will allow you to do themed concerts uh, that uh, focuses around social justice. Uh, and things of that nature. So uh, I approach my program in many of the same ways as Dr. Bove does, uh, uh, trying to give something for everybody, regardless of who the audience is. There needs to be something for everyone. And the last thing I was going to say to your point is uh, it would be great uh, if we focus on not just like how do we entertain the audience we have, but let's find new audiences, yeah. right? You, the audience you have don't like your music, find a new audience. It's not that we're trying to alienate the audience we have, but there are so many people out there who are younger ages or never touched band, don't even really understand what band is. They're like, wait, is it orchestra? No, it's not orchestra. Um, but get them in like the seat, again, with a theme, like you might invite somebody because of like a certain topic that you're going to be exploring. You can invite, you know, oh, this is going to be about nurses. So let's invite the nursing staff from like the local hospital. They can get in for free or whatever it is, but bringing people in so they can see what it's about. And you might get a lot of repeat. I, I mean, I have students in my um, general education uh, music classes that come and watch a concert because I force them to, but their reports are all about like, oh, wow, I've I didn't know what this was about. This is so fun. I would love to come to more concerts in the future. So just inviting new audiences, I think, is a really helpful way to fix that problem. I know we have some distractions over there. This is their warm up time, and due to our rearrangement, we'd have to move to this room. So we just bring you something. If you can't hear, if you'd like to move forward, I'm going to move the speaker a little bit closer to the front. Uh, but we do know that there's a distraction. This is their warm up time. So sorry about that. Uh, I guess we'll just take more questions. Yeah, let's just take some questions. Programming so, questions? Yeah. <laughs> really appreciated when you explained cake breaks to us because when I first saw it and heard it, my initial reaction was, oh God, this is a cakewalk. Why are we doing a cakewalk? You know, so when you, I think it's important for us to inform, you know, our membership, the history about a piece. Um, I was part of our, our band's um, research project to go over 30 years of music that we did. And it was quite, you know, interesting to find out just how many old dead white men we had programmed over the years. But, you know, conversely, we have been trying and doing a lot to do this. But I think, I think um, one of the things that helped me going through the music is, you know, my initial reaction was, oh God, another dead white man piece that we did. But then researching the um, composers, like, oh, he, he was possibly gay. That's interesting. But then also researching the arrangers. And I think sometimes we don't concentrate on the arrangers enough, too, because that, that can help bring a different level of importance and diversity into our program from the arrangers, too. Um, Blake, thank you for um, sharing that. One thing I should tell you that's been a highlight for me among many things on the convention is in introducing Florence Price's Dances in the Cambridge. Uh, as people may have known of her, but they didn't know that piece, and they certainly didn't know that it would work for wind band. Um, the, the arranger, Dr. Daryl Brown, who's just a phenomenal um, friend, uh, he took this on. He took this on as, uh, he said, I, this, she needs to be played. Um, and the only thing that we had of her at the time was her first symphony. And so uh, he actually contacted me and said, Wes, um, can you read this with your ensemble? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. And I just fell in love with it. And I told him, uh, and I knew I was coming here, and I said, do you mind if I do this at ACB? He said, absolutely, just do it. Just tell everybody, whoever wants it, I just want the music played. 
And so that's why I'm so thrilled that you all are enjoying it. And if you want that piece, um, I'm just doing the free advertising. Continue to sign up and I'll send it to you. So thank you. Do we have other questions? I know it's really hard to hear. What's the most interesting venue that you've had to program for and how did you go about that? The most interesting venue we've programmed for. I have one. Okay. <laughs> um, this was actually um, for a small theater in Michigan, actually, when I was at Michigan State. Um, it was for a theater that was primarily a ballet theater. And um, the theater uh, was all about dance. And so uh, you had to think about dance pieces, okay? Now this is modern dance, modern dance. What am I gonna do in the repertoire that is modern, that caters to dancers? Uh, there's not really a whole lot. And so uh, I did Don Jose Los Wendes. <laughs> And I had to think about some of the Tchaikovsky things that's happening there. So that was the most interesting for me, I think, that I had to do. Um, last year, I brought my group on a bus tour where we played at um, uh, homeless shelters and women's shelters. And so it was a, a, a repertoire that we had, um, a very flexible list. Like, when we get there, we're going to check out their vibe and see what they need. So we had some hymns, we had some kids' songs, we had some marches, and it was literally get off the bus and play, like, uh, amongst the people, back on the bus, go to the next location, and we hit, like, four spots in a, in a day. Um, so it really brought in a lot of flexibility and just, like, getting out of your comfort zone for, for my, my community band and my students in that group. But through it there was just I, I love that they rose to the occasion and there was lots of leadership that took place and everybody helping scrap, scramble with the percussion um but honestly that was like the kids were crying you know at the end of some of those uh, performances because in that way it was so much more meaningful when we brought the music to those audiences um, i have a sort of a twofold question with my own proposed solution so i'm curious about yours um when so i'm in particular try i'm generally very much for diverse um uh, programming whether or not my music is included in it is not very important i just want to hear as a concert goer i want to hear different voices and i think we all benefit most of all the audience members when we have when we have more different voices uh, but i fight for women to be performed because statistically they are they, you know they're half of our population of the world more or less um but they're uh, not being performed enough overall um so some people say that programming women composers uh, so the, the there are not enough women composers writing and so we need to encourage the next generation of women composers um, and I think the best way to do it is by programming this generation of women composers and showing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm wondering what you think about that the solutions. That's one. And the second one is, I will remember while you're answering this one, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Bobe, would you like to go first? On oh, that? sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I love your idea, obviously, of programming women composers. I make sure none of my concerts don't um, have women composers on them. And I oftentimes will bring um, a repertoire of all women composers. So, let's say an honor band, never mention it, but just make it like, yeah, this is normal, right? Like, yeah. You get some band directors coming up afterwards, but I see what you did there. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but I also think it's important that we. You know, if we think about most of our band composers come up through band, and so we have some of these women composers in our bands right now, especially at like K-12 or, or high school or college, if you have college students in your group. So um, giving them opportunities for leadership, giving opportunities for like, let's do some call and response today for warm up, and making sure that you focus on inviting the girls and young women to, to be those leaders and to, you know, oh, hey, that was a really cool idea you had, or, or giving them opportunities. Oh, you're writing an arrangement, let's play it. And so just giving students the opportunities because oftentimes statistically we look and in our communities a lot of times um the boys and young men are the ones that advocate for themselves can i do this will you play that can, can you give me some extras and so just making sure that we make sure um that 
when we do offer opportunities that we're trying to be a little bit more equal across the gender spectrum about who we're giving those opportunities to. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, an experience to share with all of you that just happened uh, not too long ago. Um, some of you might know that I was conducting in Argentina about a month ago, and then I'm conducted in Italy. I asked this question because this was intriguing. I asked them, like, if you think about Italy, there's not many female composers over there. I asked my male counterparts, you know, I, 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 I mean, I asked those guys over there, why is that? And they said, well, we just feel that composing is a man's world. Well, uh, they were very direct and blunt about that. They minced no words. Then I'm in Argentina, and Argentina has a fair amount of female composers, and they celebrate that. Uh, in fact, when I was there, there was a, a piano recital of all female composers. It was phenomenal. And uh, I asked them, why is that? They said, well, we, we believe in diversity. So it's quite interesting that you have these two different parts of the world. So that's pretty traditional, and one is pretty progressive. So I think for me, um, composing. What a great way to <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, it's not just because of the gender or diversity. One of the reasons, and this may, I don't want this to sound the way that it may come out. I, the female composers that I've played and performed and particularly listening to your music, one of the things that I love about it, there seems to me to be more clarity in that music clarity and delineation of melodic and motivic development that you don't hear in other compositions. And again, I don't mean that to come out the way that it is, but I'm just being honest with you. Oh. I, yeah, yeah, I'm serious. I'll so that's it. my experience. <laughs> I remember the second half of my question is that there's still time? Like, yeah, super quick. Okay. Um, so when, uh, you know, sometimes, when, when you come across a bless your heart situation with other conductors who say, you know, they um, want to play music, more diverse music, but it just so happens that they choose based on quality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or they uh, say, I really want to, I just don't know where to start. I usually suggest find 10 pieces by women composers that you don't like. And in that process, they will find a lot of pieces that they do like what are your strategies with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> we tried to program a minorities concert a few years ago a minority not be the, but none dead white guys. Um, and we had trouble finding quality women composers that were up to our standard of music. Um, Julie Guru was one of those people. Is there She's like not a, diversity though well, anymore? No, no but 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 she writes very good music. So do a lot of Okay, so the issue that we have is that most women composers are self publishing because they don't trust the large publishing companies, they don't trust J.D. Pepper who robbed them of like of most of the royalties. So they self-publish, which means that we as directors have to go out there and do extra work to find these composers who are struggling to survive in a world where publishers are only taking on folks that like meet their standards and their repertoire. Yes. Rashan Edizadi. Rashan Edizadi. Phenomenal composer. Yeah. 
Catherine Lacuda. Yeah. Um, if, if, uh, welcome to peruse the website and we were heard. It's my nonprofit that focuses on helping uh, gender and racial minoritized composers get their music recorded and promoted. So on that website, you will only find works by composers from a minoritized group. And so you can peruse and it's not going to be everything that you like. You're not going to love everything, but you will find stuff on there that you're like, this incredible work. Yeah. Yukiko Nishimura, Ancient Flower, my favorite piece of all band music, great too. Oh, Erica Savannah, you'll like her music. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Others? If you are looking to diversify your music, easiest website you can go to is Win Repertory Project. Yeah. They will give you like a huge list with links. Click on the links, listen. Go on Spotify. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Music. It's on YouTube. I mean, hell, reach out to me. Trust me, I am the <laughs> annoying, I'm not even calling myself a little bee. <laughs> I am a damn stingray thorn in people's sides about poor women, poor people of color in music. I'm relentless. I have bookmarks everywhere. When, Re when Repertory Project is start, there are more. Is that the one where you find my And I know that we're almost out of time here, but I want to say one last thing about just keep in line with the mission that we're, we're all in this for community. And remember that community means that we are trying to adhere or be representative of our communities. So whatever your community is, uh, you, you want to start there and see if we're giving something to those uh, the people that serve your community. And that means our greater community too, because the, the generally our, our, yeah. our ensembles, our community bands are not representative of the larger community exactly. of where we live. And there's a reason why, and a lot of times it's because the music and the style of rehearsals or invitations are not always in line with what other people feel like serves their community. So be reflective on that. Who Who's not showing up and why? Yeah. Also, for every piece by a woman composer that you don't like, I can guarantee you there will be at least one piece by a man composer that also sucks, but you don't think about that because men are not in the spotlight in this situation. It's the women who need to come up to the standard. So just, just another another resource too just to share that's out of new york institute for composer diversity it's a website that um rob deemer has started and just in terms of the search engine which it would be just nice to you can search by female you can search by all different kinds of um avenues and what you're looking to program but just something else that if, especially if you're just starting to look deeper into things it at least gives you a place to start um at the very beginning and then much, many more things after that. Diversity. We're probably out of time. Yeah. And Alrighty. I think we are. Okay, yeah. guys, thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, again, Dr. Bobby and I, even though we are primarily in the collegiate world, uh, we are about as much of our community as anyone. We serve and we try to do that in our programming. So thank you. Thank you. I want to thank both of them. Um, I think a very good analogy, the people that don't <clears throat> get to be, have their music served was how hard it was to hear just now. Mm. The thickness of what we were dealing with, they were doing something that was important you were doing something that was important, but what the feeling is, is that thickness of not being able to be heard. And that is yeah. exactly what you just felt. That's really so thank you again very much. And if you don't know who I am, I'm the president of, of the Association of Concert Bands for about six more hours. So. Thank you.